You know, today is such a nice day, I think I should take you on a tour of Haddonfield and explain to you why this town is very important to the history of the state of New Jersey and why it is so important to our dinosaur heritage. For more than 100 million years, the area now known as Haddonfield held a key to one of the biggest secrets in the entire world. Dinosaurs. So right here in this very moral pit in Haddonfield, New Jersey, was found the very first almost complete skeletal remains of a dinosaur. See? There is a very special marker right here at the very spot where the fossilized skeleton was found. Those were our ancestors, the Hydrosaurus foci. The Cretaceous period is the longest period of geologic time in which life has existed on Earth. It lasted nearly 80 million years from the end of the relatively short Jurassic period until the planet was rocked by a few literal Earth-shattering events, including volcanic activity, chaotic biological warfare, and of course the giant space rock. With this length of time, you can imagine a lot of stuff happened. That stuff really only started to be understood when Western scientists colonized the paleontological resources of the burgeoning American colonies throughout the 1700s, which began to see some real results in the mid to late 1800s, hence the Bone Wars. However, sidestepping the Bone Wars, we can of course stretch the history of dinosaur science to the first ones described. That would be Megalosaurus, Hylaeosaurus, and Iguanodon with Megalosaurus being the first in 1824. 20 years after this description, Richard Owen lumped the three into their own group, the Dinosauria. Not much would go on with the dinosaurs for the next decade until American paleontologists started collecting in earnest. We can pinpoint the Western scientific identification of the first American dinosaurs to a very brief window of a few years at the end of the 1850s, right before the American Civil War. You know, today is such a nice day, I think I should take you on a tour of Haddonfield and explain to you why this town is very important to the history of the state of New Jersey and why it is so important to our dinosaur heritage. The first American dinosaur fossils were teeth found by paleontologist and fossil hunter Joseph Leidy in the Judith River region of Montana. They belonged to Tyrannosaurs and Hadrosaurs and were given the name Dinodon and Trachodon, respectively. This was a time in which paleontologists thought that any anatomical differences in teeth were indicative of real evolutionary differences. Therefore, people were naming new dinosaurs based on all sorts of isolated teeth. This is now a quite dubious practice. It's mostly mammals that work like this. So these were technically the first named American dinosaurs, but those names would go on to become entangled in all sorts of taxonomic nonsense and are largely considered dubious today. The next dinosaur found, only a year or two later, was so much more complete that it better deserves the title of first American dinosaur. Before I get into that story, I would like to briefly acknowledge that Native Americans had known of dinosaur remains for many hundreds of years before the colonizers did. Some even had the right idea in comparing them to birds. Hayden Field, New Jersey would be the city to host the remains of the first good specimens of an American dinosaur, which would also happen to be the best specimen of a dinosaur that had yet been found. For more than 100 million years, the area now known as Haddonfield held a key to one of the biggest secrets in the entire world, dinosaurs. In 1838, John Esta Hopkins, a local farmer, was excavating rock from a marl pit on a small tributary of the Cooper River to use as fertilizer. When he and his crew started finding stony bones, fossils, Hopkins was not exactly looking for them as he wanted nutrient-rich marl clay to fertilize his farm. However, the fossils were curious enough to keep and he displayed them in his home for a time. Fossils make great conversation pieces, so no doubt visitors saw the bones and interpreted any number of things. 20 years passed before the bones inspired someone who was visiting the area on vacation to go to the same marl pit and find the rest of the skeleton. William Parker Folk, a Quaker, philanthropist, abolitionist, geologist, and amateur paleontologist, was just that person. 
Curious about the fossils, he asked Hopkins if he could see them, but the farmer apparently had grown bored of the bones and disposed of them without ceremony or thought. Perhaps more lay in the marl, thought Folk, and was granted permission to search the clay and silt. Once he went out to the pit, he immediately found what he was looking for. He sent word to the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences, of which Folk was a member, and a team was mobilized to the site by October of 1858. Understanding the ramifications of what was being uncovered from the site, Folk also contacted Joseph Leidy, who was a professor of anatomy and chairman of the Board of Curators of Philadelphia's Academy of Natural Sciences at the time, to come take a look. Altogether, the fellows excavated the fossils, wrapped them in cloth, covered them in hay, and hauled them back to the Academy of Natural Sciences for further preparation and study. Stray thought, but can you imagine how hard it was to prepare fossils back then? They didn't even have dental instruments to reallocate. Knives, brushes, chisels, and shovels were what they had to work with, and to their credit, they used them pretty well. So, once they got all that stuff back to the museum at the university, what did they find? The specimen was of a large herbivorous animal that included only 35 bones, teeth, maxilla bits, lower jaw chunks, 3 back vertebrae, 13 tail vertebrae, a bit of the shoulder girdle, most of the left arm, one of each of the pelvis's pieces, and almost all of the left leg. Folk and Lighty studied the fossils together, but didn't take long to write up a description. Lighty's imagination fired and interpreted neither bison, mammoth, nor world flood casualty, but a dinosaur a member of a newly named branch on the Tree of Life. This dinosaur was unique. It was no lumbering quadrupedal hulk like those then recently described in England. No, this animal had grace and was able to stand on its hind legs, holding its head aloft among Cretaceous conifers. On December 14th of 1858, Dr. Lighty presented the work on this dinosaur to the members of the Academy. It was officially named Hadrosaurus Folkii, Folk's bulky lizard, to honor the man who'd finally given the bones the attention they deserved. Apparently, the genus name was supposed to be in reference to Haddonfield, so Lighty likened the official name to a play on words between the Latinized Hadros and the town's name. The discovery was momentous for a few reasons. It fully validated the work of the English scientists decades prior, Richard Owen, William Buckland, Marianne Mantell, and Gideon Mantell. Dinosaurs were, in fact, a real group of giant reptilian animals before the age of mammals and after the age of fish. Hadrosaurus also provided the first complete evidence for what these animals may have looked like. Before Hadrosaurus, the dinosaur fossils discovered were extremely fragmentary. It's how scientists at the time came up with the giant rhino-horned elephantine iguanodon, quadrupedal croc-snouted hump-backed megalosaurus, and rear-spined frumpy hylaeosaurus. Unfortunately for the study of dinosaur physiology though, the gracile and upright nature of Hadrosaurus would mostly be ignored or recontextualized for the next century. Dinosaurs would be considered slow, fat, swamp-dwelling monsters of antiquity. The original publication of Hadrosaurus was in 1858, and Leidy would try to publish another paper that described and figured the bones in more detail within a year or two of the first paper, but the American Civil War would break out and push that date to 1865. With this paper, Leidy had provided some great references. Ten years after Hadrosaurus was first named, a team of artists, which included then-famed English sculptor and naturalist Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, tried to piece together a skeleton that could be exhibited. Hawkins was renowned at the time for the colossal Crystal Palace Park project, in which Hawkins and his crew created around 29 sculptures of 15 genera, from the Paleozoic to the Cenozoic, displayed in the park outside of the Crystal Palace in Bromley, England. This was the world's first dinosaur theme park. With an eye for detail and drama, Hawkins took Folk's bones and Lighty's ideas and constructed a skeleton, lanky and pensive, like a dancer paused in thought. Hawkins sculpted a blunt plaster skull, iguana-like, but bearing the battery of unique grinding teeth found in the marl. The mount was a sensation. The exhibit drew huge, raucous crowds. This wasn't just the first evidence of what dinosaurs looked like, but that these impressive skeletal reconstructions could be great revenue for museums. 
Scientists from museums and institutions across the US and Europe flocked to the university to see how they did it. This hadrosaurus skeleton was not the very first extinct animal skeleton to be reconstructed, mounted, and displayed. A distressingly chimeric mashup of ancient whale, ammonite, and other fossils artificially extended to 114 feet was first put up on display in New York City around 1845. Plus, mammoth skeletons had been mounted in museums for a while. However, Hadrosaurus was the first dinosaur and employed some new techniques, one of which was a system for molding and casting copies. According to the official Haddonfield Hadrosaurus website, the initial Hadrosaurus skeletal mount had no original bones in it. It was a plaster cast. More recent historical research into this would find that the original skeletal mount did have at least some original fossils in it, as some parts of the skeletal mount had drill holes where you would expect the metal mounting to fit into. And those drill holes were in real fossil material, so at least some tiny bits of the original skeletal mount were indeed real fossils. The first official copy after this prototype was arranged to be holding onto a fake tree like many ground sloth reconstructions at the time. This cast mount was made with the intention of being a part of Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins' next magnum opus, an American version of the Crystal Palace Park dinosaurs called the Paleozoic Museum to be located in New York Central Park commissioned by Joseph Leidy. Hawkins established a studio where he and his crew began construction of a bunch of statues, including many plant hadrosauruses plus skeletal mounts. One of the concepts shows two hadrosaurus, one rearing up against an attacking theropod and another reposed like a giant house cat. There are also two of the theropods arguing over a recent hadrosaurus kill. Aside from the dinosaurs, you can see a plesiosaur, two glyptodonts, two ground sloths, two elephants or mammoths, and a large feline. One illustration of Hawkins' workshop shows the reclining hadrosaurus and the plaster skeletal mount plus a pair of megaloceros and a crocodilian-like reptile. Here is a photo of the workshop that the illustration is based on. Another piece of concept art shows some more little critters of uncertain affinities. Here's a photo of the workshop that includes some work-in-progress skeletal mounts as well as what is probably an ostrich. So far, I've referenced this proposed museum in past tense, and this isn't just because it happened over a hundred years ago. That Paleozoic Museum was never realized. For the longest time, the corrupt politician William Boss Tweed was blamed for the destruction of Hawkins' models and workshop. However, in 2023, reanalysis of historical records found that it was actually treasurer and VP of Central Park, Henry Hilton, who ordered the destruction. As far as is known, this was because Hilton was simply an ignorant and corrupt fool who didn't like the museum, stating that Hawkins should not bother with dead animals as there was enough to do among the living. Hilton was also in charge of building up the American Museum of Natural History and possibly didn't want competition. I think it would be neat to try and get some funding together to reconstruct Hawkins' work and concepts to bring the Paleozoic Museum back to life, but that's quite ambitious. Another copy of the original skeletal mount was made for exhibition at the 1876 U.S. Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia's Fairmount Park. In 1879, another copy was sent to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh, Scotland, making it the first dinosaur skeletal mount on display in Europe. The Smithsonian Museum got a copy as well and put it right out front. Leaving a plaster skeleton outside was not a smart move as the thing quickly deteriorated and was sent to the collections where it may remain to this day. Another copy was sent to the Princeton University Museum. And yet another copy seemed to have made its way to the Field Museum in Chicago. Hadrosaurus's status as the only dinosaur skeletal mount was taken in 1883 when the Brussels Museum put up a bunch of iguanodon skeletons that were discovered in a coal mine. Since Hadrosaurus was the first major American dinosaur discovery and the first to show that the dinosaurs weren't essentially giant lizards, its name got thrown into the miasma of scientific fervor of the end of the 1800s. Many species were named for the genus based on various fossil specimens that would turn out to be too distinct or not distinct enough to the original hadrosaur specimen to belong to the same genus. 
Other times, separate genera and species were used to describe specimens that would go on to be lumped into the Hadrosaurus name, only to be found to be a worthless piece of flotsam that cannot be lumped. You must be pretty important to be written about in books. When I get home, I'll borrow one from the library so I can read about you. Ornithotarsus immanus, Cope, 1869. In 1869, the famed Edward Drinker Cope described a specimen of the very end of the lower leg and the start of the ankle bones of a dinosaur as Ornithotarsus immanus. This specimen originated from the 84 to 78 million year old Merchantville Formation of New Jersey, which is around 80 miles from the original Hadrosaurus site. In the nearly 140 years after this description, the specimen had been considered a nomen dubium, mostly with some experts thinking it may belong to Hadrosaurus fulcii, therefore being a synonym. However, a 2006 paper by Albert Prieto Marquez, David Weishampel, and Jack Horner re-evaluated the specimen and could not square some of its traits with those of Hadrosaurus, so the name remains even though the bones are so fragmentary as to be nearly useless anyway. Hadrosaurus tripos, Cope, 1869. Also in 1869, E.D. Cope described some more scrappy material, USNM 7190, 7093, 7094, and 7095, as another species of Hadrosaurus, Hadrosaurus tripos. These specimens, which were just some tail vertebrae, were relinquished to Nomen dubium in 1942. Then, a paper in 1979 reanalyzed the reported rock layers where the fossils were found and discovered that they actually belong to the Pliocene Epoch. So, the 1979 paper re-identified the bones as actually belonging to a whale. Which almost seems a weirdly bad mistake for Cope to make, but then again, Elasmosaurus. Hadrosaurus Minor, Marsh, 1870 in 1870, the other half of the Bone Wars, Othniel Charles Marsh, described another species of Hadrosaurus, Hadrosaurus minor, based on YPM 1600. Some back and lumbar vertebrae from the Hornerstown Formation or Navasink Formation of Barnesboro, New Jersey. Other material that has been referred to this species has been YPM 1587, a femur fragment from the Marshalltown Formation of New Jersey. YPM 1593, a vertebra from the Hornerstown Formation, ANSP 15237 from the Hornerstown, ANSP 15202, a bit of hip, femur, fibula, and some vertebrae from the Navasink Formation, NJSM 15136, the center of a vertebra from the Navasink, and NJSM 11880, a left tibia also from the Navasink. These extra fossil specimens have been attributed to the species over the 140 years after it was named, but the species Hadrosaurus minor was synonymized into Edmontosaurus in the late 1970s, eventually further being sunk into the two currently valid species of Edmontosaurus. One paper in 1942 and a 2006 paper both found that these remains are too scrappy to be assigned to anything more specific than the Hadrosauridae family. So the whole jumble of bits are now considered nomen dubium. Hadrosaurus cavatus, Cope 1871. Cope was pretty fervent with naming new things on very fragmentary specimens, and he would do so hundreds of times over the course of his life. Another was Hadrosaurus cavatus, which he named in 1871 based on four tail vertebrae that were found in a layer of rock called the New Egypt Formation near Swedesboro, New Jersey. This specimen, AMNH 1390, would go on to be lumped into the genus Trachodon by Oliver Perry Hay in his 1902 Bibliography and Catalogue of the Fossil Vertebrata of North America. Since the vast majority of fossils that have ever been named Trachodon have been found to belong to much better and already named dinosaurs, all of those fossils cannot be Trachodon. The only ones that are still considered validly Trachodon are some hadrosaur teeth. This means that Cope's Hadrosaurus cavatus bones are most likely not Edmontosaurus, Trachodon, or Hadrosaurus, and are too piecemeal to really responsibly name. Hadrosaurus agilis, Marsh, 1872. In 1872, O.C. Marsh published a few hadrosaur specimens as another new species of hadrosaurus, Hadrosaurus agilis. 
This specimen was bits of the skull and an articulated skeleton, so as good or slightly better than the original hadrosaurus material. Marsh eventually reanalyzed this specimen and found that there really were too many traits that were different from hadrosaurus, so he renamed it Klausaurus agilis in 1890. BMH R1007, Lydecker, 1888. Paleontologist Richard Lydecker attributed the transverse section of a dinosaur tooth to Hadrosaurus that was found in Huddersfield, New Jersey. But since it's even smaller and more useless than the last remains, this can be pretty much scientifically ignored, aside from general biodiversity information. Hadrosaurus breviceps, Marsh, 1889. A chunk of lower jaw from a hadrosaur, specimen YPM 1779, was uncovered from sediments of the Judith River Formation that were eroding from the mouth of the eponymous Judith River, and then described by Marsh in 1889 as another erroneous species of hadrosaurs, Hadrosaurus breviceps. Specimen AMH 8525, which is just a bunch of teeth, was also slapped with this name in 1972. All of this stuff went from Hadrosaurus breviceps to Trachodon breviceps to Critosaurus breviceps by 1942. All of these designations are considered dubious today though, so they can be thrown out. Hadrosaurus possidens, Marsh 1889. Another Judith River Hadrosaur specimen was uncovered from the Dog Creek locality. Specimen USNM 5457A, which is a chunk of the skull and upper jaw, and was described by Marsh in 1889 as Hadrosaurus possidens. A year later, Marsh would reanalyze this specimen and describe it as belonging to a Ceratopsian dinosaur instead. In the half century or more after this, many other paleontologists would re-examine this specimen. John Ostrom thought it belonged to the axe-crested Lambiosaurus, but much more recent analysis in 2006 found that the specimen doesn't really have anything to distinguish it as such. Therefore, it is also dubious and can only be referred to the general Lambiosaurinae group. Phew! That's pretty much all of the known specimens ever labeled as Hadrosaurus. The only things that can be validly claimed as Hadrosaurus is that first specimen. Now that I've thoroughly covered this poor creature's history with humanity, I think we need to get to the bottom of what the fossils themselves tell us, and how the animal is seen today. My name is Harry Folkai. I am the official dinosaur of the state of New Jersey. I don't think it takes a genius to tell that Hadrosaurus was a duck-billed dinosaur, since it was the first of these dinosaurs to be realized for what it actually is. It was the one to give its name to the entire group. Sure, Iguanodon, a non-hadrosaurian ornithopod, had been known earlier, but remember it was a giant rhino iguana for quite a while. Anyways, Hadrosaurus is the reason for the Hadrosauriformes, Hadrosauroidea, Hadrosauromorpha, Hadrosauridae, and Hadrosaurinae. This is all that is known of Hadrosaurus. As you can see, it's missing any sizable remains of the noggin. This makes it hard to have enough anatomical traits to use to put the critter in a clear family or to figure out who else it was related to. This is why a lot of paleontologists just thought of Hadrosaurus as a dubious dinosaur for many decades. Papers in 2006 and 2011 were able to suss out enough anatomical details from the bones and compare and contrast those with the much larger number of hadrosaur material discovered since the description of Hadrosaurus to more robustly back up the validity of the genus. This is how he got the most recent and robust organization of Hadrosaurus. It belongs to its own subfamily, the Hadrosaurinae, as the earliest branch of the Hadrosaurinae, right before the group branched into the Sauralophinae and Lambiosaurinae, plus the small assortment of standalone critters that cannot be placed in a subfamily. Thanks to the missing pieces, what Hadrosaurus looked like when alive has to be inferred from its relatives. But since it doesn't have any super close relatives in its own subfamily, paleoartists and paleontologists have filled in the missing bits with Hadrosaurs like the bubble-nosed Gryposaurs, Critosaurs, and Rachelophosaurs. There isn't really any non-arbitrary reason to use these guys, aside from Hadrosaurus being more primitive than the flamboyantly crested forms like Lambisaurus and Parasaurolophus. The earlier the hadrosaur branches off the tree, it seems, the less crazy the head crests. So recreating hadrosaurs like a gryposaur is more about being conservative than fully on point. 
2016 saw the description of the Alabaman Eotrachodon, which consists of a nearly complete skull and scrappy skeleton. This critter has a similar face to many of the big-nosed Sauralophanes and has been found to be the closest to Hadrosaurus yet found, having diverged right after it. So there is at least some animal to use as a basis for Hadrosaurus now. Since every analysis has the chance of shaking up the evolutionary tree based on what data is or is not used and based on whatever new critters are factored into the analysis, Eotrachodon and Hadrosaurs have been moved around a bit over the years since 2016. 2022 saw an analysis that placed the Chinese Nanyangosaurus as the next dinosaur to diverge from Hadrosaurus, with Eotrachodon the one after Nanyangosaurus. So, Hadrosaurus itself remains tentative, but the rounded, big-nosed look the head has now is a more reasonable assumption for Hadrosaurus, hence the new, mostly fabricated skeletal mounts. With the phylogenic placement of Hadrosaurus sort of sorted, what does it mean for the animal and what it looked like? You're, you're a devil? Since the best idea of its head has to be inferred from relatives like Nanyangosaurus and Eotrachodon, the head of Hadrosaurus was most likely quite deep, round, and thin from side to side. In other words, it may have had a large domed snout, square jaw, tall jaw articulation, and a rounded and wide beak shaped like the fleshy lips of a moose. There is a strong possibility that the end of this beak had striations or ridges of some type, since this is present in many other hadrosaurs from all over the hadrosaur tree. After all, these dinosaurs were very much not duck-billed, despite their nickname, and had a bunch of different beak shapes. Some had such exaggerated beaks that they looked almost like mustaches. Thanks to the limbs and how conservative hadrosauroids have been over time, the rest of hadrosaurus can be more confidently reconstructed. The animal had smaller forelimbs than hind limbs with small, tightly bound hand and finger bones. It walked on hoof-like mitten hands, likely with only a single nail-like claw on the outside, and maybe with a small pointed claw sticking out to the side. This look is based on the well-preserved mummified hand of Dakota, a specimen of Edmontosaurus. Hadrosaurus likely had tall neural spines, since this is common among most hadrosauroids. The tall neural spine crest ran from the middle of the back to the middle or end of the tail, and some specimens even preserve tendons that cross-hatched over this sail that hardened into bony elements. This crest was more of a hump for muscle attachments than a thin sail for display, though a display function can't be ruled out either. This is a good idea of how the critter lived, but it doesn't tell you how harsh life was for Hadrosaurus, or dinosaurs in general. A 2003 study by Bruce Rothschild, Darren Tank, Mark Helbling, and Larry Martin x-rayed, CT scanned, and cross-sectioned over 10,000 specimens of living and extinct animals to figure out how to screen for tumors or evidence of tumors in extinct animals. This massive study only found evidence of tumors in hadrosaur dinosaurs, and hadrosaurs was one of the specimens used that showed evidence of tumors. This team specifically found hemangiomas, desmoplastic fibromas, metastatic cancer, and osteoblastomas. These tumors were seen in the tail vertebrae, and the study concluded that these things may have been a result of environmental factors or genetic inheritance. I mean, it obviously wouldn't have been a lifestyle issue. This is interesting because many more later studies would go on to find tumors in Paleozoic tetrapods as well as other dinosaurs, like a particularly poor Centrosaurus. Now that a good image of the life and times of Hadrosaurus can be cobbled together, about how large is this image? In order to get a good visual representation of the size of this animal, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planets the Most Extreme. Enough of the skeleton is known to get a general estimate of its size, something even Lighty had done back in the late 1800s, though more recent estimates are definitely more accurate. Hadrosaurus is currently accepted to have grown to at least around 7 to 8 meters, 23 to 26 feet in length, with a weight of 2 to 4 tons. Not the largest, but far from small. Thanks, Mr. Man. Okay, so we have an exhaustive understanding of the history of how this dinosaur came to be known by Western science. We have as good of an understanding of what the critter looked like as is possible, what kind of cancers it may have had, and what size it was. Now I think I need to explore where it lived and what that means for dinosaur evolution. So obviously this critter was found in New Jersey. It's like the second most unusual thing about it. 
The rock layer that marl pit that produced the bones belongs to is currently understood to be the Woodbury Formation. This formation is not super well studied. Then again, most Mesozoic rocks from the East Coast are not well understood. Unlike many other places in the world, that is not for lack of trying, nor funding. After all, the East Coast was the economic center of the US for quite a while leading up to the discovery of the critter. The lack of sizable tetrapod remains from this layer has made it difficult to get any solid understanding of the actual biodiversity of the time and place of Hadrosaurus. So many researchers and artists have merged many formations from the same general region at roughly equivalent times to generalize. This layer dates to between 80.5 and 78.5 million years ago, making it the early Campanian age of the late Cretaceous Epoch. Carbonized wood, pyrite, and bivalve fossils have been recovered from this layer, indicating the area was largely marine. This means that, like Klausaurus, the body of Hadrosaurus had filled with gas during decomposition and floated out to sea before popping and sinking to the bottom to be covered in silt and becoming a fossil. The lack of dinosaurs is related to the marine nature of this layer of rock. Non-avian dinosaurs were not marine, crazy as that may seem. The layer of rock below the Woodbury Formation is the Merchantville Formation, and this one was a bit more terrestrial. The fossils that have been recovered from this layer include Tyrannosaurs, Hadrosaurs, Turtles, Mosasaurs, and Ornithomimosaurs. A 2017 paper described two dinosaur specimens, a Tyrannosaur and a Hadrosaur. The Tyrannosaur consisted of a foot, a claw, and a tail vertebra, is closely related to Dryptosaurus, and was going to be named Cryptotyrannus, but the author opted for being conservative. The Hadrosaur was a little more complete, with a jaw, shoulder girdle half, and some leg bones, and was going to be named Atlantohadros, but alas, being conservative. During the time of both of these formations, Eastern North America was a separated continent called Appalachia. Not much is known because of a lack of good fossil layers and outcrops, plus all the cities, plus most of the region is covered in forests. That being said, what little has been found shows that the continent was really weird. It was stocked with a bunch of primitive lineages that colonized the whole continent before it was split via sea. Dryptosaurus and Appalachiosaurus are the most complete tyrannosaurs from the region. Dryptosaurus is from 67 to 66 million years ago, while Appalachiosaurus is 77 million years ago. This means that there is a possibility for overlap between Appalachiosaurus and its kin with Hadrosaurus. Aside from these Tyrannosaurs, there are Ornithomimosaurs known, such as Archansaurus. This theropod is from much earlier than Hadrosaurus or the Dryptosaurs, but similar forms were running around with the later dinosaurs. No advanced Ceratopsians are known, but tiny fragments from a late Cretaceous Neoceratopsian is. Think Leptoceratops or Udanoceratops. These dinosaurs were present in North America in the early Cretaceous, like Aquilops, having migrated into North America from Asia. I wonder if they ever convergently produced Ceratopsid-like forms in the Lost Continent. Aside from everything I've just said, there were probably some forms of sauropods, dromaeosaurs, thyreophorans, and the usual pterosaurs, birds, crocs, turtles, frogs, etc. From what the rocks say, the region was similar in climate to the other half of North America, being subhumid and paratropical, with lots of coastal plains and forests full of pine trees, ferns, redwoods, poplars, cycads, and more. Appalachia was around the same latitude as much of northern Laramidia, so it would share at least some of the same biomes, though Laramidia had more mountains at the time, so that would definitely have messed with its climate. A remarkably interesting lost world that has only just begun to be unraveled. Gee, this building is awfully large. There are so many hallways. Hadrosaurus remains an iffy dinosaur specimen, but it was our iffy dinosaur specimen, damn it! It was the first thing that American scientists could hold up and say, Hey, this is our dinosaur, and this is what the dinosaurs looked like, you lying best. I mean, uh, yeah. Hadrosaurus holds a lot of historic value. Enough value for some people to do some stuff to honor it. In 1984, a local Haddonfield Boy Scout, Christopher Breeze, did a project about Hadrosaurus and its dig site. Like any kid obsessed with dinosaurs, he took the project quite far, enough to get locals and paleontologists reinvested in the historical value of the site. 1991 saw Hadrosaurus become the official state dinosaur of New Jersey. You mean it took a law to be passed to make me the state dinosaur?
The Marl Pit site was rediscovered and eventually designated a National Historic Landmark in 1994, given the name of Hadrosaurus Park. I wonder if any more excavations could be done there with that landmark designation. That is the beginning and the end of Hadrosaurus. Once hailed as the Rosetta Stone of dinosaurs, it's now one of over a hundred dinosaurs that were running around on broad three-toed feet, chewing up their food with innovative batteries of cheek teeth and trumpeting with some of the most intricate resonating chambers to ever evolve. I think we owe Hadrosaurus a little respect. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.